Okay, it is my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome Dr. Janice Swab here. Every conversation I've had with her is always fascinating. Uh, she has been teaching uh, for many years, I won't say how many she can if, if she would like, mostly in North Carolina, um, uh, most recently in Meredith, and then also I think adjunct teaching with NC State as well. Um, teaches on uh, plant biology, environmental sciences, all kinds of things, but you know you're really a good teacher when they have you teaching how to teach science. That's when you know that, that you really uh, combine all the elements. So, so you know it's going to be a great uh, talk here. Uh, reading Janice's bio, it's, it's uh, even for somebody like me who gets to travel a lot, it's, it's really um, uh, uh, gets me a little envious. So Fulbright grants to Egypt, Sudan, Zambia, and India, four semesters of teaching in China, research in the USSR, and I believe that was when it was closed to most everybody else. Um, and, and what really gets me traveling to study plants in the footsteps of Charles Darwin all the way around the world, uh, really um, just has been all over the place studying uh, plants and, and the environment all over the world. So please help me welcome Dr. Janice Swan. I hope that I'll be able to keep you uh, through the end. This uh, is a kind of a different uh, sort of talk, uh, but to anybody who's interested in plants, seed banks would be, uh, uh, I hope, uh, an interesting topic. At least uh, give us uh, something to think about. Um, seed banks um, are not uh, what you um, hear ecologists talk about. Uh, being in the soil, the seed bank in the soil, where the seeds uh, that are in the soil come up and you have to weed uh, year after year after year. Uh, so this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about seed banks uh, where seeds are kept as if they were in a bank, but uh, you uh, can't leave them in there forever and we'll see why. Um, we don't know much about seeds. We don't know about the dormancy. We don't know how to tell whether they're viable without planting them and letting them grow, um, or putting them under conditions so they'll germinate. Um, uh, so we, uh, uh, if we're trying to bank hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of seeds, uh, and we don't know a lot about them. Um, so uh, what is a seed? And this is just for people who might have uh, wandered in by mistake. Um, <laughs> you are gardeners and you know what a seed is. Um, it's an embryo. Someone has said it's an embryo in a lunchbox. Um, it's an embryo with its stored food. Um, and there are two kinds of seed plants. Those uh, that we refer to as gymnosperms. Gymnos uh, comes from the same word as gymnasium. The wrestlers in the early gymnasiums wrestled naked. So gymnos. Uh, refers to that, and sperma is always seed. Uh, angio, an angium is a covering, so these seeds are within a covering. Gymnosperms, these are the seeds uh, in things like pine cones, that the pine cone opens up and the seeds fall out. There isn't a covering to hold them in. Angiosperms, there is. Another uh, uh, word for angiosperms are the flowering plants, and this is the life cycle. This is the part that students hate, until they really get into it, and then, of course, they love it, um, I hope. Um, <laughs> se uh, the seed, the seed uh, is that part of the embryo with its uh, lunchbox, uh, and the seed germinates. The germination is a process that we also don't understand that much about. It either happens or it doesn't, uh, and it is much studied, but there's a lot more to study. And then the plant grows to maturity. At some point, it flowers. It could be uh, a matter of weeks. It could be a matter of months. It could be a matter of years, decades even, before it flowers. Uh, and then, uh, in the flower, a fruit will be produced. Uh, these are all uh, fruit-bearing plants that we're talking about when we talk about angiosperms. And the fruit that we're in, and the, the angio, the covering that we're talking about, is the fruit that contains the seed. Sometimes they break open, the seeds fall out, sometimes you have to dig into them, sometimes you have to really work to get them out. 
but basically this is the cycle that we're talking about because I'm not really going to um, uh, talk that much about angiosperms. Uh, let's look at the differences in the sizes of seeds. The very smallest ones don't adhere to this uh, food <clears throat> uh, idea because something like an orchid is so tiny, we're talking about little dust particles, so tiny that they have to have an external source of food from a fungal mycorrhizal situation before they can even germinate and begin to grow. And then you have the largest seed in the world, which is the uh, coco de mer, um, uh, which grows in only one place in the world, and that's the Seychelles. Uh, and that seed weighs about 40 pounds, uh, which is the reason why I'm not trying to hold it up. And uh, uh, so we have a, 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 a gamut from, from very uh, small to very large. Um, if, we look, if we look at a little bit of the history of, uh, uh, of seeds, uh, we learn that um, uh, the, the history um, uh, of seeds is tied in with agriculture. Uh, agriculture uh, and human history uh, go a long way back together, uh, at least 10,000 years, probably more in, in some places. So it's a long process that's been going on for thousands of years. Uh, and it didn't happen overnight. There was a gradual evolution in the, in the agricultural lifestyle. Uh, it's complex, and it's surely not sharply uh, delineated. Why were people motivated to change their lifestyle from a hunting, gathering, sort of laid back uh, lifestyle uh, to um, a, a lifestyle where they, they planted by the, uh, by the sweat of their brow uh, they worried uh, uh, from year to year about keeping the seeds and having them available and uh, worried about them growing. Uh, when did uh, they begin to realize that this process would happen anyway? Uh, and surely they thought that seeds could be kept and used to provide a reliable source of food season after season. But it didn't always happen. And there are people who uh, would claim that, um, uh, that this is where religions began. The, the, we know that there were a lot of rituals tied up with the harvest and with the planting. Uh, and perhaps these uh, led to uh, what we know today as religious practices. So agriculture um, uh, might have led to, <coughs> to religious practicing. Uh, and then we think maybe that uh, uh, the counting of seeds might have led to the first uh, use of a, uh, of a uh, writing, a uh, form of writing that we know as cuneiform, which is that, uh, that doesn't have any uh, uh, curved lines, but it, they were uh, drawn in clay, so it was a whole lot easier to write with straight lines. And, and the earliest records that, can, that we can find of this uh, early form of writing uh, was, uh, we believe, um, a, a re records of, uh, of barley uh, harvests. Uh, so uh, it's quite possible. Uh, so people uh, for thousands of years moved around. They took their seeds. They took them to and from uh, wherever they went. Uh, and, and it was thousands of years uh, before uh, botanical gardens were established. The oldest botanical gardens are in China and in Europe, the oldest ones in Europe being in, uh, in Italy. Um, and so botanical gardens then became established. And so you might say that not much happened for a few thousands of years, and then uh, people uh, began to appreciate uh, grow growing plants and the, the beauty of walking through a lovely garden. And certainly the Chinese write a lot um, about this. So we're going to fast forward to uh, the year uh, uh, 1916 when a man by the name of uh, Vavilov, Nikolai Vavilov, um, uh, came to work uh, at an institute in Leningrad. Uh, it, um, uh, it had been founded in 1894 as the Bureau of Applied Botany, and uh, he began collecting plants uh, and in 1920, Lenin founded 
the, the Institute of Applied Botany, and the reason he founded it was that grain shortages were a way of life in, the, in, uh, in Russia and subsequently the Soviet Union. Grain shortages. And Lenin said, we have got to figure out a way to prevent grain shortages, not to attack them after they're already happening. And the best time to, to prevent a grain shortage is before it happens. So in 1920, um, uh, he founded the Institute of Applied Botany and made Vavilov uh, the director. Um, and he, he traveled all over the world. He had hundreds of botanists. This was a time of, uh, of really good funding because Lenin could give him ever how much money he wanted to, you know. Uh, and so um, uh, botanists from all over the world at Vavilov's uh, behest, began collecting, and their whole focus was crop plants. And they and they collected all over the world. And Vavilov collected as well and traveled uh, uh, all over the world. And he began to see, for the first time, that uh, certain par parts of the world had plants that uh, were uh, more diverse. Um, and we can use potatoes in Peru. Um, uh, or we can use um, uh, whatever, and there are lots and lots of examples. But the more diversity uh, that he saw, he, he reckoned that, the, that these places had been the places where these plants had been cultivated the longest. His focus was entirely on crop plants. But it was not just on crop plants, it was on their wild relatives, a very important uh, aspect for us to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and so he uh, uh, said there are eight centers of, of crop origin, and, he, and, and this uh, map uh, shows them. Uh, it is impossible to overstate the value of what Vavilov uh, understood and the way he inspired botanists uh, who worked at his institute to go out, it was not easy collecting around the world and collecting these thousands of, uh, of crop plants, uh, but they did it. However, uh, while he was director, and he was only director for uh, 20 years, um, he also founded 11 um, seed bank uh, 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 institutions and uh, research, uh, botanical research institutions all through uh, Russia, that vast expanse of, uh, of land. But he fell afoul of Stalin uh, because Stalin uh, was, un was in, in thrall of uh, Trofim Lysenko. Some of you know the story of Lysenko, uh, totally pseudoscience. Uh, and uh, uh, and Vavilov uh, adhered to Darwinian principles, and so um, Stalin sent, sent this man uh, who, uh, was, uh, who had an understanding of plants that no, literally no one else in the world understood in his day, sent him to a prison camp. Uh, he died in 1943 in, Sar in Saratov prison of starvation and mistreatment uh, by his uh, guards. Uh, one of the great uh, uh, and saddest ironies, certainly, that we can, uh, can think of. So he died in 1943. So he was not in Leningrad during the siege. But it's the siege that I want to uh, uh, say something about tonight. I know that many of you know the story of the siege of Leningrad. Uh, and you may or may not know the story of the Vavilov uh, Institute and the workers there. But if there, is any, this, if there is only one person in here who does not know this story, it's worth telling because I think it's one of the most important plant stories that uh, we can find in the 20th century. The Vavilov Institute is in one of these huge palace, uh, former palace buildings uh, just across from uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral. Uh, if you've been to Leningrad or St. Petersburg, you know, you can call it whichever, it changes from time to time. Um, uh, this, that's the huge uh, building that is across the street from, uh, uh, from uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral. Uh, and at the time 
of the beginning of the siege in 1941, there were 40 rooms of seed collections being kept in that building that these people had, had uh, collected from all over the world. Most of the workers in this uh, institute uh, it was, it, uh, was referred to uh, by the acronym VIR. Most of the workers were sent to the front, but many of them were uh, left around Leningrad to do uh, particular things and, and were assigned duties nearby. Um, and they began, those people who were left in the institute, began um, uh, g getting those collections together and getting them ready to uh, uh, try to um, uh, get out of the city. Um, uh, and they prepared duplicates. They made uh, various packets out of, uh, uh, out of individual collections. So if they could only take a certain number, they could take the most important ones. Uh, and the potato collection was especially a problem for them because they, um, uh, they needed to plant out the potato uh, collection because it, it, uh, couldn't be, it couldn't be kept and, it, and uh, they didn't have the seeds, they had the actual uh, potatoes. Uh, and so they went to a nearby experimental, uh, experimental station and I'll uh, show you that uh, later, about 45 uh, kilometers southeast of Leningrad. They took these potatoes in boxes on the only road that they could use, and they were constantly under fire. They went in the spring of 41, in the spring of 42. They, they um, uh, planted the potatoes. Uh, they were barely able to harvest them, and the Red Army actually helped transport them back to the Institute uh, before the Pavlovsk experimental station where they were working actually uh, was, uh, was seized. Uh, as, the, as the siege wore on, um, conditions got much worse. There was no heat, there was no water, uh, and people began, as you uh, know, um, hunger uh, was rampant, and then uh, after two years of uh, uh, serious starvation, people were dying. It's uh, believed that a, about a million people died during this time. Only a few workers were left, and they kept those potatoes uh, in the basement where they burned cardboard, they burned wood, they burned debris from buildings to just try to keep the potatoes. Uh, it wasn't a matter of keeping them cold. It was a matter of keeping them from freezing because it, from freezing, really seriously freezing, uh, because in that uh, winter, the, the temperature in Leningrad on many days was minus 36, minus 40. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about centigrade or Fahrenheit, that is cold. <laughs> and um, uh, those buildings, I, I just uh, want to tell you from experience, I have worked, I didn't work at the Zavilov, but uh, uh, I worked in those huge buildings. And they are cold when it is warm. Uh, so it is impossible to be uh, warm in those uh, huge buildings. Uh, so these people then were surrounded by food. They were working desperately to get these collections in, in a shape that they could get rid of them, uh, get them out if they, if they possibly could to a better place. Uh, and they did uh, get the potato collection from out of the basement in 1942. Um, they moved the collection from 40 rooms down to 16 where they could manage and keep them uh, uh, in, in a smaller place so that uh, the people who had figured out, starving people who had figured out that the Vavilov was there, uh, they knew about the Institute. Uh, and when they began thinking about the fact that there was food there, um, uh, there was a serious uh, a problem. Um, so they sealed these 16 rooms. Uh, they were, no one, uh, the workers, no one was permitted to go alone into these rooms. The keys were kept in, in the director's safe, and the keeper went in once a week into these rooms to open and check the boxes, re-close them, and lock the rooms again. So this was done on a weekly basis. Um, difficulties multiplied. Uh, rats got to eat too, uh, and the rats, uh, of course, didn't take them uh, but a, about a year and a half to find the collections. 
these were in cardboard boxes. And, and these starving people uh, began to change these collections from these uh, boxes that were so easy to uh, uh, breach into uh, metal containers, working day and night under the worst uh, of conditions. Um, they, uh, they saw where the rats were coming in, they sealed the doors, they broke up glass and put into the holes and put poison uh, into the holes. Uh, they worked day and night to uh, keep these uh, collections uh, rat free. Uh, and in the meantime, um, other of the potato uh, uh, of the potato collection uh, had to be um, planted out, and so they found a plot that they could get to that was not being uh, shelled, uh, and with no mechanism, no uh, 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 tractors or horses or whatever, they took spades and they planted hundreds and hundreds of collections of these potatoes, uh, let them grow, and, uh, uh, and harvested them. Um, and that was done by these starving people. Uh, uh, they, one of the reasons that they uh, uh, divided up the collection was they wanted to make sure that all the collection of any particular thing was not in one place, because the building might be shelled. Um, and, uh, and the collection would be destroyed, so they wanted to make sure that at least if the building uh, uh, were partially destroyed, the collections wouldn't be. Uh, but they didn't know that Hitler knew the value of this Vavilov collection, and he had already uh, made sure that when they entered Leningrad, uh, victorious as they had planned to do, that he was going to take that entire collection uh, back uh, with him to Germany. He understood the value. Um, of course, it didn't happen, and the institute was never shelled because it was very close to the Astoria Hotel, which is uh, where Hitler was going to have his great celebration. You probably all know the story that he had already written out the invitations. Of course, it didn't happen. Uh, and so they didn't know that they weren't going to be shelled, but they got ready just in case. Even St. Isaac's across the square was uh, was shelled, but not uh, uh, not the Vavilov. Um, and so, um, uh, by the time they were uh, digging potatoes and bringing them back and trying to keep the the uh, uh, collections going um, and uh, dividing the collections, trying to get them ready when they could uh, get them out of the city, by, the t by 1944, nine of the scientists had starved, uh, some of them at their desks, surrounded by tons, not a little bit, tons of seeds and plant parts that could have been uh, eaten. But they saw that, and it was of course that they lost vision, uh, they saw that as Russia's future and did not uh, even touch those collections even uh, to death. The Russians remember this. They spoke of it often when I lived there in the 70s. Um, and so in 1946, when the war was over, the first thing they did was to, to get all of the people <coughs> of all the Vavilov collections together in the various uh, 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 institutes that he had founded to decide what they needed to do with the collections and how they could best do uh, what they needed to do to save them. And it is remarkable that these collections came through uh, nearly uh, undamaged. Uh, the quality of those collections uh, and the diversity of the plant material made it the most important um, uh, seed collection in the world at that time uh, when the war uh, uh, had ended. And I will just uh, also tell you that in, in um, the 1990s, um, the um, the curator of the U.S. National Small Grain Collection requested from the uh, Vavilov Institute uh, shipments of several dozen old American wheat varieties from the Institute that were absent 
from the U.S. collection in Aberdeen, Ohio, in Aberdeen, uh, Idaho. Uh, and those collections, the reason they wanted those from the Vavilov is that they uh, had resistance to the Russian aphid that was, during that time, damaging fields in the U.S. What did the Vavilov Institute do? They uh, sent the seed materials. Uh, they have, uh, and they had, and, and have uh, collections from uh, more than 70 collections uh, uh, just of, uh, of wheat uh, and, and wild uh, strains of wheat. Today, the Institute, like all uh, institutions in the Soviet Union of Science, are negle is neglected. I do not know the current state of it. Um, uh, and uh, if you know, if uh, I have not, I have not been able to visit it. When I was there in the 70s, you didn't just go waltzing into places like the the uh, uh, Vavilov, uh, because uh, I was warned before I left the country that uh, I had to follow all the rules uh, <laughs> from the National Academy. I think they were worried, and uh, so so it is uh, a wonderful story. Uh, and if you look at the Pavlovsk experiment station, that's where they grew those potatoes. Today, that is the furthest northern uh, experiment station in the world, and they have an unparalleled collection of fruit trees, uh, uh, fruits and fruit trees, not all trees, but lot of things like strawberries. But they have, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, fruit shrubs, they have fruit trees. And in, 19, and in 2010, um, it was decided that this was going to be um, uh, destroyed uh, to build a housing uh, development. And it is one of the most valuable <coughs> fruit collections in the world. And I still haven't found. It, was, it, it didn't happen because during that very uh, year, there was a drought uh, and there were uh, a number of problems. Uh, with some of their crops, and so the, the Institute was focused on helping with that. So it gave them a kind of reprieve of this uh, experiment station. This is the one that they uh, uh, grew the potatoes in under fire during the time of the, uh, uh, of the siege. Uh, and I don't know what has happened. Botanists from all over the world um, uh, very strongly um, um, fought this, and I don't know uh, I, I don't know the current state. So um, here we are uh, after thousands of years of not doing very much. Uh, Vavilov uh, has the vision. And, and during the, uh, the 1900s, the mid to, to late 1900s, uh, institute after institute after institute, international institutes were founded. This is not all of them. These are just the ones I had room for. And, um, uh, and they became uh, an extremely important and are an extremely important source of, uh, of botanical uh, material. Uh, the World Seed Banks uh, today coordinate uh, their work through the International Seed Treaty. It was not until 2004 that, uh, uh, that uh, seed banks were able to get together and agree that they would abide by this uh, treaty. It's been signed, as you can see, uh, by 135 countries in the EU. And they included 35 <coughs> crops that were so important that they said, we must share this material. We must make it available all over the world. But they didn't, uh, they, nothing is perfect, of course. Uh, and they were not uh, able to uh, include everything they wanted to include. But they, there are no, excuse me, uh, there are no soybeans or peanuts uh, in that uh, list, uh, largely because of uh, countries like China that uh, uh, refuse to agree. Uh, but um, uh, today, there are at least 1,750 seed banks, and there could be more. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, sure. So, so I'm going to only choose a few seed banks, the, the really uh, uh, most critical ones and the ones that maybe we know the best. And the first one I'm going to choose is from the U.S. and I don't uh, have a picture of it. But that's the, foot, that's the seed bank at Fort Collins, uh, which is what we refer to often as the National Seed Bank. That's not its official name, National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation. 
but nobody says that. They just <laughs> say National uh, Seed Bank. Uh, it was opened in 1958 by uh, President Eisenhower, uh, and uh, then they expanded it starting in 1991. Uh, it's called the Fort Knox of the world's food supply, um, and it contains now uh, more than two billion uh, uh, collections, um, individual collections, uh, in this uh, very well uh, uh, built, uh, very highly reinforced uh, structure at, uh, at Fort Collins. Um, this facility is a part of the Department of Agriculture, so they um, emphasize, they emphasize uh, food, uh, of course. Uh, not only do they keep uh, the seed bank, but they also uh, keep genetic material in um, uh, steel vats and liquid nitrogen to preserve the, uh, uh, the DNA. The critical factors in any of these collections are temperature and humidity, and this is what uh, uh, this is what people have to be very careful of. Uh, with the right conditions, it's believed that rice uh, seeds can live for uh, 200 years. Perhaps wheat seeds can live for 400. But then the only way you know whether a seed is living is to grow it, is to germinate it. And, and uh, it's an amazing um, uh, thing to think about that we, that we don't uh, that we have to kill the seed, not to kill it really, because it can grow. Uh, but we have to um, take the seed out of the collection and grow it in order to find out whether it's actually viable. Uh, the next uh, and and a most important uh, seed bank that I want to, to mention to you is the Q Millennium Seed Bank uh, at Wethurst Place in West Sussex in, in the south of England, and some of you may have visited it. Uh, and when when it was um, uh, founded, uh, it's a part of Kew Gardens. Kew Gardens uh, is more than a, a more than 250 years old now, um, and uh, this is uh, built. This has been built. This Wakehurst Place uh, for the specific um, uh, keeping of the seeds. I'm going to show you a short video about it. It was opened by in 2000 by Prince Charles. <coughs> It, it is named for, and they have good funding, uh, and, and it isn't by accident that the building is named the Welcome Trust Millennium Building, um, and it's more than 49,000 square feet uh, of, of, of the collections that you're going to see in just a minute. They have laboratories, they have seed preparation facilities, they have public education. Uh, you can walk in, I'll show you a few pictures in just a bit. You can walk in like we do down at the museum downtown uh, and watch the scientists uh, in the new part of the museum doing their work behind glass. They've got the same kind of thing. You can see them um, uh, preparing the seeds. You can see the kind of things uh, that they do uh, uh, to, to uh, get the seeds uh, into a condition to uh, keep them uh, in the bank. Uh, their aims, uh, when, the, when uh, it opened, uh, was to uh, store, uh, quote, all of the UK species, and they've come really close to that. They've come really close. By 2010, they wanted to uh, uh, bank uh, at least 10% of the world's flora. They finished that in 2009 with 24,200 accessions. And when they collected their billionth seed, uh, did they keep it a secret and uh, just go about their work? No, they had a big celebration on Downing Street uh, at the invitation of Gordon Brown, and they figured that that big deal was worth about 600,000 uh, pounds in uh, advertisement revenue. So they don't uh, keep their seeds under a bushel, so to speak. Um, the, uh, the, latest, uh, the latest seed count uh, uh, from, from the Millennium <coughs> Seed Bank is 36,333 species with over 2 billion, yes, that is a B, uh, seeds in, uh, in storage. Of course, the, the bank at Fort Collins uh, has uh, more than 2 billion uh, as well. Uh, somehow, 
I think that we are not doing uh, the job we need to do in terms of advertisement. Uh, and so the partnership now that, that uh, the uh, Millennium Seed Bank uh, has uh, formed with at least 103 organizations in 54 countries, that keeps uh, going up, which is a good thing, uh, is to help concentrate the collecting of the world's flora. Uh, and they're trying to uh, collect, uh, especially in the most threatened areas. Uh, we all are aware of what uh, I call uh, global climate chaos. It is not change, it is not warming, it is chaos. Uh, here we have hurricanes, there we have uh, uh, drought. Here we have rains, there we have uh, snow uh, in, in proportions that we've never uh, experienced in, uh, in many cases since records have been kept. So in the midst of this global chaos, um, seeds are having to, uh, plants uh, and seeds are having to uh, adjust uh, maybe more quickly than they might be able to uh, adjust. Um, collecting them while they're still here is, uh, is of paramount importance. They have strict collecting guidelines. They just don't just go out and collect everything. They have uh, strict guidelines so that they will not uh, uh, unduly uh, affect the, the uh, population. And they also have a new project uh, called the Crop Wild Relatives Project. Why is this important? Because we have got to get the wild relatives, Vavilov uh, uh, taught us that, when we can. They are disappearing as habitats disappear, uh, as, uh, as uh, climates uh, uh, change, uh, and so they're trying to um, uh, collect in as many of these places as possible. I have dozens of examples of why this is important but I don't have dozens of minutes of time, so we'll, we'll just uh, uh, continue. And this is the, the uh, seed bank that I've just uh, mentioned. This is the Millennium uh, Seed Bank. Um, and these uh, 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 eight parterres uh, are, uh, are plants of the various ecosystems of, uh, of uh, uh, the British ecosystems. Beautiful facility. Uh, lovely uh, grounds to uh, uh, to enjoy, and uh, oh, I thought we should be pointing in that direction. Um, so uh, I'd like for you to watch this, um, uh, which will be worth more than uh, ten thousand words, not just a thousand words. And I know you're tired of hearing words, uh, but this. This will give you a view of not only the Q Millennium Seed Bank, but other uh, the same the same um, way that other seed banks operate. Okay. Oh, I guess I have to. No, uh, do I have to? to no? I keep on losing the cursor. Uh, yeah. Okay. It should. Uh, there we yeah. go. The main challenge is time. We're racing against it. We don't know what's going to happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And we really need to get those species in before they become extinct. The Millennium Seed Bank is uh, the seed bank of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. We are the hub of a global conservation network collecting and conserving seeds of wild plant species. We have already banked about 15% of the world's bankable flora. Uh, we aim by 2020 to collect 25% of the world's flora, which would be 75,000 plant species. It's the biggest conservation project on Earth. The Millennium Seed Bank works with 150 partners worldwide. Each country defines their own priorities for collection. Uh, generally, these tend to be the three E species, the economically important, the endangered, and endemic species. Endemic, these are those species who occur only in that particular region or area. Unfortunately, many plant species are threatened worldwide. Kew Gardens did a study about three years ago and found out that about 20% of all plant species are threatened with extinction within the next 30 or so years. Our partnerships in Africa 
I also geared up towards making sure we breed the next generation of agriculturalists, of botanists, of taxonomists. And Q is playing a major role in this capacity building, making sure that we're working closely with our partners to spot their gaps, to fill those gaps. We've launched our new MSc program. We have a number of African colleagues coming over to join us for that MSc program. The Millennium Seed Bank partnership, at the heart of the partnership, not just about seed collecting, but to make sure that our institutions, our partner institutions, have this capacity to help them get on and do the job. That's what's going to make it sustainable. Every week, almost every day, it's our birthday because we receive um, parcels from our collecting teams across the world. I find it always very interesting just to see from where those seeds arrive. So this is just a random selection of crates here in the dry room. So here, for example, this is uh, from South Republic of South Africa, a batch from Italy. We have Chile here, the Philippines, further down South Africa again. They arrive with courier service. Um, they are then unpacked and checked. Uh, we measure the initial moisture content of the seed. And then they go into the dry room. The seeds stay in this room for a few weeks or months. And that's the best way of slowly drying them to uh, about 6 to 8% absolute moisture content, which is the ideal condition in our experience of then freezing then for long-term storage. Kiosk Millennium Seed Bank is not just a repository of seeds. Uh, it's an active seed bank where we actively research our seed accessions. And wherever possible, we make those seeds available to researchers for, for example, use in forestry, in agriculture, for uh, future crop breeding, um, or to plant those seeds back into the landscape. We make sure that we secure seed collections in seed banks, not just in, the, in Waco's place here at Kew, but also in those seed banks in our African partner countries. Lots of uh, tree species are threatened across Africa, and that's because of the forest loss that we've, we've been facing over the past 50, 100 years. Um, but also now we're looking very carefully at those relatives of our crop species, a lot of the grasses, a lot of the beans uh, that are, people get a lot of nutrition from and across Africa. We need to make sure that we're conserving those wild relatives from, those, from their wild populations. Crop wild relatives are the wild cousins of our crop groups. They are found in their natural habitats and they contain a, gen a genetic diversity that we don't find in the crops that we can cultivate today. They haven't gone through the bottleneck breeding procedure, so they contain all the wild genetic traits that we might need now and in the future to produce new varieties to tackle against climate change. 80% of our calorie intake comes from just 12 main species. 50% of, of that calorie intake comes from just three species, wheat, maize, and rice. If we lose one of those species, we need to be able to produce something else. We need the diversity of crops to have that insurance to be able to produce new varieties in areas where climate change is really affecting the current agricultural production systems. This is really crucial to tackling food security now and in the future. And that's the end of it. Um, The main challenge is time. We're racing against it. We don't know what's going to choose. It's uh, the seed bank of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q. We are the hub of a global conservation network. Uh, and so, around the world, uh, there are uh, numerous seed banks now, especially uh, in uh, more developed countries, that really are working hard to keep these collections uh, and to make new collections, of course, uh, making them now while plants are still available is important. And I particularly like this Australian uh, facility, so that's the reason it's there. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to give you just a few examples now of some of the recent projects. 
and one of the most recent ones is called Seeds, for, Seeds of Success. Uh, the the uh, North Carolina Botanical Garden is part of this. It actually started uh, uh, some time ago in the West. It's funded by the BLM, um, the Bureau of Land Management, um, uh, through the Department of the Interior, and it has one um, uh, purpose, and that is to restore ecosystems, to restore after floods, after fires, after hurricanes, whatever. So um, the, there were no projects in the East, so the, uh, the University, the, the uh, uh, North Carolina Botanical Garden at Chapel Hill, uh, the New England uh, uh, Botanical Society, the, um, and a New York City uh, uh, facility uh, got together and got a grant. And what they are doing, uh, and the reason they got the grant is because of Hurricane Sandy. So uh, they uh, call it um, uh, the, the uh, Sandy uh, Supplement Mitigation Fund because they realized that after Sandy with such um, a that they couldn't restore those areas because they didn't have the plant material to restore. So what they have done, uh, this is the second year of the project, uh, last summer they sent out four students uh, uh, to collect uh, seeds that were, um, they, they, the organizations got together, decided which seeds they needed to collect, uh, taught the students uh, uh, what they looked like and how to find them, uh, and so they went out and there were over 200 uh, that they chose uh, that were of particular importance. And of those, they collected um, almost um, all of them last summer and this summer. They certainly um, uh, will be collecting uh, all of the species. Uh, I have a former lab assistant who is uh, working on that project, and there are three women and one uh, guy uh, who are out there on a daily basis in these uh, areas collecting hundreds of thousands of seeds uh, that are going to be banked to keep for, uh, for restoring these ecosystems along the, the uh, coast from Maine to, uh, to North Carolina. Uh, there's much more that we could uh, say about this, but uh, uh, I'll not uh, say more right now. Um, Uh, so there's the seeds, of, the seeds of success, and then the most recent one that I know anything about, and there may be one uh, cooking right now uh, and going to be uh, uh, announced tomorrow, uh, but is the Global Gene Initiative uh, that uh, has been started by the Smithsonian. They are taking their plants uh, from the U.S. Botanical Garden, the U.S. National Arboretum, all the Smithsonian Gardens, uh, and they are um, uh, uh, banking, banking those seeds, except they are not just banking the seeds, they're taking uh, as much material as they can for, uh, for genomic uh, analysis. And so they are, uh, and, and so it's referred to as the, as the uh, uh, Global Genome Initiative. I think I put gene on there, but it should be genome. And so they're, they are collecting for that purpose and they're calling it the Global Genome Initiative because they want to collect, um, within the next two years, half of the world's living plants. So you see they're getting more and more bold about their, uh, their plans. Uh, and I think it's the seed bank, uh, the Millennium Seed Bank, that's uh, getting them uh, uh, to do this because uh, nobody wants to get left behind. But this is a good thing. Uh, we don't want uh, anybody to get left behind. We want them to have good collections too. Um, there are two kinds of collections, and, and I've used the words, but uh, I didn't uh, say anything about what they mean. Uh, ex situ and in situ. Uh, ex situ is all seed banks. You take the, the plant part, you take the plant out of its uh, environment uh, and put it in a glass jar you've got an uh, ex situ um, uh, situation. In situ simply means growing. That's what all these plants out here are doing in the arboretum. They are growing in, their, uh, in the ground. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the most important in situ um, uh, organizations 
uh, is the Center for Tropical Plant Conservation. If you get a chance to go in, in, uh, uh, to the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden in Florida and, and see this Center for Tropical Plant Conservation, they're collecting palms, cycads, tropical fruits, tropical trees, uh, largely from South Florida, the Caribbean, the, uh, some of the, the nearby Oceanic Isles, uh, tropical Africa and Madagascar. Why are they growing them in situ? Because you, they can't bank those seeds. Those are tropical plants that don't lend themselves to banking. So to provide the space and the labor uh, and the kind of work that it takes to keep these things growing uh, is the kind of, uh, of contribution that the uh, Fairchild is making, and they're not the only one. So very quickly, I'd like to uh, mention some issues that we have to deal with when we're talking about seed banks. Uh, and the first are disasters. We, uh, we know um, uh, uh, about uh, wars. We know um, about all manner of uh, natural disasters. But do we think about the seed banks? In the 1970s, in Cambodia, the seed banks were all closed. In 1974, the war that toppled uh, Haile Selassie destroyed all the seed uh, that had been collected. In the 1990s, Somalia lost two very important uh, seed banks. Uh, Afghanistan's collection was destroyed when the, uh, when the Taliban uh, took all the, all the airtight containers because they wanted some, some metal containers. So they destroyed the seeds uh, to uh, 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 take their airtight containers. Uh, in 1996, before, before anybody thought about 2001 and all that's happened since, um, the Iraqis took their seeds, took a, a large number of their seeds to Syria because Syria was a central collecting place. Uh, so that when Iraq was invaded, um, they, they didn't have their whole collection there, but the, the workers at the seed bank, um, uh, and that seed bank was located close to Abu Ghraib, we've all heard of that place, um, when looters came and destroyed everything that was left, although uh, many of them had been, um, had been rescued by taking them to, uh, to Syria, a, quote, safe place. Um, uh, the same thing happened in Baghdad. They took them to Aleppo. So what happened? Um, then when Syria uh, was, uh, uh, was under attack, they quickly, as, as, uh, uh, as quickly as they could, rescued as many uh, of the seeds as they could before the fighting uh, began. Uh, but they were unable, of course, to rescue uh, nearly, nearly the whole uh, collection. Uh, things happen uh, in, in Bari, in, in uh, Italy, one of the finest uh, Mediterranean collections. Uh, at one point, uh, their cooling units failed, and they lost uh, many of their, uh, of their seeds. Uh, in, in a place like Thailand, that, uh, where there are constant floods, uh, collections get lost just because they're, they're flooded. Uh, in the Philippines, in 2006, their collections were destroyed by uh, a, uh, uh, a fierce typhoon. So, um, uh, what, do we, uh, uh, what do we say? We say that uh, all collections are under stress. Um, in, in Fiji, for example, they gave up trying to keep those valuable taro and yam uh, collections because of the problems. And in these hot countries, in these, these uh, poor countries, even keeping the temperature uh, uh, at, a, at a, a constant level is, uh, it is a challenge. Um, and with these seed banks, things happen because nations don't want to um, uh, sometimes work together. Uh, sometimes, especially uh, developing countries have had bad experiences with first world countries taking their gene plasm and I'm not going to go into details. I could give you many details. Uh, and I want to remind you that collecting is a dangerous business. It's a whole lot easier to sit in front of a computer and plot maps than it is to go out 
into these dangerous, often dangerous, field habitats and try to collect thousands of seeds. Number one, you've got to know what they are. You've got to be a taxonomist. And number two, you've got to be able to, to take the field conditions. And number three, you've got to know uh, what you're doing once you get out there. There are fewer and fewer young botanists, uh, certainly in the developed world, who are willing to do this. And that's one of the reasons that Q is trying to train uh, indigenous people in Africa to, um, to make the, the uh, collections. They also know how to operate in the country better than, uh, than foreigners. If we are going to stop our gene banks from becoming germplasm morgues, we're going to have to um, uh, spend a lot of money and find a lot of people to do the work. Uh, also, who knows the, the uh, condition of many of the, of the collections. Um, one exasperated uh, uh, director of a, of a bank in Latin America said, I think that we spent more money over the last 30 years having gene bank conferences than we have in trying to keep our, um, our collections alive. Um, uh, because you, it, it's very discouraging uh, sometimes. Um, and, and I want to point out, and I'm only going to point it out, I'm not going to go into any big detail, but we are losing crop diversity by, by the very uh, reason that, that these crops have been chosen over these millennia. Uh, what, what farmers wanted to choose, they chose. Many other uh, uh, possibilities went by the wayside, and especially with the advent of the Green Revolution and with the, with the, the uh, seeds that can be genetically modified uh, and, and the bit higher yields, these plants uh, that have uh, a wealth of, um, uh, of genes that we need uh, are simply being ignored and falling by the wayside. That's the importance of these wild uh, relatives and the, the um, uh, uh, and uh, the, the importance of collecting them. And uh, uh, the seed bank's increasing importance <coughs> as global chaos, uh, global climate chaos, there are other kinds of chaos too, but uh, uh, the global climate chaos reigns uh, and, and we, uh, uh, we have the ecosystems destroyed, there's development, you know all of the things that are destroying ecosystems in this day and time. Uh, incidentally, I just want to tell you that there is a sort of interest in the plant seed bank connection. You will never be without the possibility of getting marijuana seeds. And um, uh, they're advertised all over the, the, the web. I'm not talking about a government facility here. Uh, but uh, lots of seeds are banked that we don't think uh, very much about. Um, and uh, uh, and there, there are... Uh, banks, or not banks, but there are places where things like poppies are grown and, and kept under uh, very strict conditions. We saw those uh, in Tasmania, for example. Don't try to, to touch the fence. It wouldn't be a good idea. Um, and uh, the, the take-home message here, if I have a take-home message, uh, and I hope I do, uh, is that there is one way to keep diversity going, and that is to plant these seeds. Though we can all be important people, we can all be heroes of the, of the uh, germplasm of, of these uh, seeds by, by planting these old varieties. The seed savers, there was an article uh, in the News Observer, I brought it here, it's over there on that table, uh, in January about all the catalogs you can get and all the seeds you can order, and you can get them free. All you have to do is grow them and, uh, and share them. Uh, and it is such an important thing for us to uh, think about. Um, uh, after I came back from the Soviet Union, um, uh, the seed savers, uh, seed savers used to be called Seed Savers International, um, and now it's uh, uh, just Seed Savers. Um, uh, had just been founded in, in, uh, in Iowa. It's one of the most important uh, 
uh, seed exchanges in the world. It's called the Seed Savers Exchange, I guess now. But uh, when I came back from, from uh, uh, Russia uh, and they were offering some of these Russian varieties, I got some and gave them to my father for Christmas and he had a great time growing them and showing everybody that he was growing Russian plants. And, uh, and, and uh, we need to be doing this. We need to be um, uh, doing our part to grow these, uh, uh, to grow these uh, uh, plants. I want to say just one uh, other thing, and that is that seed banks are absolutely critical. Uh, we, we know that. But when a seed is in a seed bank, it is not evolving. It is not out there uh, with the stresses and the strains of the environment. Uh, and so uh, it's important to realize that seed banks um, are, are not a perfect uh, uh, answer. We believe that there are uh, some health benefits uh, of growing certain plants over other plants, varieties over other plants. We need to be finding out well, what these uh, uh, what these are and and uh, uh, using uh, new and different varieties as often as we can. So. Uh, this is the, the thing that got me into this trouble, and you uh, 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 in, into the trouble that you're in because of it. Um, and that is my trip this past uh, <coughs> summer uh, to the Svalbard, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the uh, Arctic, to what is often called the Noah's Ark of concrete, uh, the Doomsday Seed Bank. Uh, but if you call it by its, uh, uh, by its uh, correct name, it will be the Colvard Global Seed Vault. It is cold up there. Um, uh, you are 78 degrees north um, there. Uh, you are 812 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and, but it's warmer than it used to be. Um, these, uh, that's the good news, though I don't know it's actually the bad news. Um, but the ship that I was on was not an icebreaker. Um, it, it went into the, the uh, Arctic Ocean. I have a map if you want to remind yourself of where these places are. Uh, it went in and there for the first time about two years ago, certainly uh, a year ago, um, there are waves in the Arctic. The ice is so broken up. The ice has retreated so much during the height of the season that there are waves, and I, ha I was sick enough to attest to that. So uh, <laughs> let me just say that uh, that was not fun. Um, uh, and so you go to the to the small barn, uh, uh, which is which is the the uh, archipelago uh, here. It uh, belongs to Norway. They're the only people you can trust nowadays. And uh, so the world uh, gets together and decides that this would be a great country and a great place to build the ultimate seed bank. Uh, and uh, uh, this is just to remind you that if you go to Longyearbyen, it's the only uh, settled place on the whole of this archipelago. Uh, uh, if you go to Longyearbyen, uh, they warn you, they give you a map, and they warn you and they tell you where they're watching for polar bears. You get outside that uh, line and you're on your own. Uh, and you wouldn't believe how many people with uh, guns that they've never fired uh, go out and take a hike and encounter a polar bear and it doesn't turn out well. Uh, but, but, this, but this is the, the place where the, the um, uh, global seed bank uh, is located, the Global Seed Vault, they call it. It is a strange and wonderful place. Uh, it is uh, built back into the permafrost. Uh, you enter, you don't enter because you can't go in. Uh, I knocked on the door and nobody answered. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you go down a, a hall that's 100 meters to, to three uh, large vaults uh, that uh, will hold literally millions of seeds. Uh, you can only uh, uh, put seeds in uh, if you are uh, uh, a seed bank organization. It have, they have to be backed up. You 
can't just put seeds in there as the only uh, uh, as the only repository. Uh, they they um, accept only crop seeds because remember this is a last resort uh, kind of uh, uh, of situation. I'm glad that's a reindeer and not a polar bear. And uh, uh, and and they um, uh, agree that they will only the the organization that supplies the seeds uh, will put them in and they are the only ones that can take them out. You have to pay to get them there, although uh, the, the organizations that are um, in charge of the, the, um, uh, of the vault uh, pay the upkeep, the Norwegians paid uh, the uh, uh, $8 million that it took to uh, build it over a period of two years. It opened in 2008. And there are three partners uh, that uh, are uh, that, that control the uh, that manage. I guess would be a better word. The seed vault, the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Agriculture and Food, the Nordic Genetic Resource uh, Center called Nordgen, and the Global Crop Diversity Trust that I mentioned to you before uh, earlier. It is entirely underground except for the uh, entrance. Um, it was blasted from the permafrost, and it is believed because they've been they have been keeping these uh, uh, same conditions uh, in the Nordic countries for uh, many years now. They believe that if the permafrost does begin to melt, um, uh, and it melts even faster than than uh, it's predicted, that there are 200 years here. They just close it. Uh, and uh, and it uh, stays uh, not at minus 18 like it is now, but it stays around minus uh, two or minus three, uh, but not enough uh, to cause uh, probably uh, tremendous problems. Uh, but the point is, uh, there are no jihadis up there. Uh, yeah. There, um, uh, nobody's flying uh, airplanes uh, into this, um, and um, and it, it there are no floods. Uh, there are no hurricanes, um, there are no typhoons, uh, there are um, lots of reasons why this is a good uh, location. In other words, really, nobody wants to go up there. And uh, the first withdrawal, I'm sorry to say, the first withdrawal of seeds was last uh, September when Syria, because their collections had been destroyed and they were so valuable and they make them available to uh, researchers, uh, they're not just keeping those seeds, they are being used. Uh, they uh, are, have put them in uh, Morocco and uh, in uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, but, but they had to take, they had to take out their uh, selection of seeds uh, in, in order to uh, replenish their supply, and they were, they were allowed to do that. Uh, there, there are at least 190 crops already there. There will be more, of course, in the future. They don't open the bank, but two or three times a year, the vault, uh, but two or three times a year. It's supposed to actually be open this month. I don't know whether they uh, are planning to, but it was, but they had planned at one time. And then um, I think they had said that it might be opened in May. Uh, but very elaborate uh, uh, arrangements are made. Uh, to, to put your stuff in there. Uh, and and um, I may have said it, but I'll say it again, only crop, only crop plants are accepted, and they have to be backed up. This cannot be your only uh, seed bank. Um, and so um, it's very well cited. Uh, if I turn around from where I am like this, I see the airport. It's the only airport uh, on the whole archipelago, uh, but it's uh, very well cited for carrying the, uh, uh, the seeds in, and they are all uh, brought in um, by plane, and, uh, and then the deposits uh, are made. And I am sure that it is safe because I'm sure that those tracking stations are there uh, for the purpose of making sure that the seed bank is safe. Uh, so we have nothing to worry about. Uh, thank you very much.
how high above sea level that um, concrete arc is? Um, uh, it's it's about I'd say just judging from standing there, it's about two stories. It, it's not you could see um, uh, you could see uh, oh right there yeah thank you uh, that uh, well I guess it's more than two stories uh, but you can compare <laughs> but it's uh, it's in the permafrost it was blasted that in terms of the seeds in terms of where the collections are kept. I think they did that just to have uh, a really interesting looking structure. Yeah, I, uh, I thought they, they might uh, might be endangered by uh, sea level rise eventually. Uh, well, uh, if the Arctic rises, I think we're all in trouble. <laughs> but we could all be in trouble. Uh, uh, we may be in trouble now. I don't know it. Uh, uh, so, Edgar and I have can genetic modification be done at the seed stage? If the seeds? At the seed stage. Oh, 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 absolutely. But what they really um, are using the genetic material for is to just try to figure out what kind of genes are in there. But yes, yes. And there are, there's a technique for doing huh, anything that you want to do with a plant at any stage. Uh, not, my, uh, not my job, as they say. Uh, but, uh, well, it wasn't but, clear to me how these seeds, they're being collected and preserved and shared around the world, perhaps, but it wasn't clear to me how scientists are using them. Oh, uh, they are using them to, they are using them to study the DNA, to, to try to identify uh, uh, the genes and to find <coughs> genes, for example, that would, and of course the only way you can really tell is to, uh, is to do the, the growing, uh, the, what, what might give them... Uh, drought uh, tolerance or snow tolerance or, uh, or that kind of thing. But, but it's, it's, for studying, it's for studying the genomes. And that's a very simple answer, I know. And uh, if I tried to get into the details, I would embarrass myself. <laughs> What's your general thoughts on local seed exchanges, seed banks, and like patented materials, patented seeds? Uh, I. Um, uh, now, these people at the Arboretum know a whole lot more about this than I do. I was under the impression that you can't patent seeds. I thought they um, decided that that was not a good idea. Yeah, I don't know if you can patent seeds, you can patent plants. You can patent, yeah. But, but as, as a, yeah. I don't, um, I don't think so. I think that has been fought. Uh, that battle has been fought and, and lost, uh, unless I'm badly mistaken. That's not to say you can't, I just don't think so. And, uh, seed books say that you should store the seed in the refrigerator and not the freezer and make a presentation they are freezing the seed. Yes, they are because they want to keep them long term. And you'll notice from looking at the, uh, at the video, they dry those seeds down to a very low water content. That's the secret. It's, it's a combination of temperature and, uh, and, and humidity. Oh, and I didn't answer that other question. I think um, uh, uh, I think that that whatever kind of germplasm you have that you want to grow out is a good idea. Variety, the more variety we can get, the better. And there may be people who know far more about that than I do. Uh, yes, you mentioned the green revolution. Yes. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not exactly that, but, it's not, but that's very close. What happens is that they use a single genetic, um, um, a single type of genome, let's say, because it gives you a heavier wheat uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, is easier to harvest, let's say, and, and that's one example. But it's the planting of the same genome. It's essentially the plants are all clones. Uh, and it can be the potato, as in, as in the potato famine in, in Ireland, 
where you're planting essentially the same plant with the same genes that are subject to the same um, uh, diseases or the same uh, problems, let's say, uh, for where, where they might uh, be able to uh, live or not live. Uh, but that's when you've got whole fields, as we have of corn uh, in Iowa or wherever, um, and, they, and it's like having a single plant out there. Here comes um, a rust through, let's just say, um, uh, and, and it's a dinner plate. Uh, it, what strikes one strikes all. Uh, and, and the danger of the diversity is, uh, as they said in the, uh, in the video, uh, the danger of the lack of diversity uh, is that, you know, essentially overnight, uh, we haven't gotten rid of wheat rust yet, the wheat rust that, that is such uh, a voracious uh, problem for wheat. We, we, still haven't, uh, we still haven't won the battle against the um, uh, Irish potato, uh, the Phytophthora, the, the uh, 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 potato blight. Uh, we still haven't won that. Uh, and as long as McDonald's is, uh, is calling the shots in terms of what kind of potatoes they want that will fit their uh, French fry machines, uh, we're not going to uh, have the diversity um, in, uh, in our potato crops, for example, that we, uh, that we need. Um, I hope that, an that answer is not too simplistic, but, uh, but it's just, just the lack of diversity. And yes, um, uh, the Green Revolution uh, uh, not only gives more food and, and in a smaller acreage, but it is, not a, it is not an unmixed blessing. These plants are like babies. They have to be coddled. They have to have a certain amount of water. They have to have the, the right growing season. Um, uh, and, and if you've got the same, essentially the same plant, the same genome out there, and it gets hit by something, it's gonna take, uh, it's gonna take the whole crop. Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons why the poorer the farmer, the, the more likely uh, uh, she or he is to keep, to keep these seeds uh, and plant and not, not um, uh, take a chance on what they are uh, given so readily that require a certain amount of fertilizer and a certain amount of water and a certain amount of, of a, a certain length of growing season and that kind of thing. It's wonderful if you've got all, that, all those inputs. But, uh, but when you don't, uh, uh, and you have to depend on that crop, we don't have any concept of that here because we have food from all over the world. But for those people who depend on those crops, uh, they, keep, uh, they keep their seeds, they keep their, their diversity and well that they would. Uh, does, does the seed bank also keep information about the growing conditions that are ideal for the plants? I mean, because they're coming from all over the they, world. And they, keep, they keep all the information, where they came from, uh, uh, what, the, what the growing conditions were like, and that sort of thing. All of that is, is a part of the record. Yes, a part of, of, their, of their record. Uh, I'll give you just one example of, of, uh, that I personally have, uh, and, and y'all have just been to Cuba from the garden, I think. <coughs> Uh, from the from the arboretum, uh, but we were in Cuba in 2005, and um, and what they talked about with us was the fact that when the Soviet Union fell and were no longer able to to give them the inputs, the fertilizers and 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 what they needed to grow those uh, crops, that they became an organic nation, uh, <laughs> and they uh, have. Uh, uh, have thrived uh, because of that. And certainly uh, these people who've been there uh, and, and who know much more about it than I do could, uh, I think, uh, agree with that. Yeah, yeah with that. So let's have one more question. And are they doing any of the seed banking for these rare plants that carry oh. drugs and things? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. One of the, uh, one of the problems with having to give a five-hour lecture in one hour uh, is that you have to leave out stuff. And, and absolutely, rare plants, plants that are known to be, uh, or to have been used medicinally, 
uh, plants that, especially right now with the with the, uh, the global climate chaos, especially plants that are able to tolerate drought and plants that are able to tolerate salt, uh, uh, salty conditions, the the soils in many areas are uh, are becoming more saline, um, and and so um, it's it's. It looks simple on the surface, but it isn't simple at all. Thank you very much.